Hi, I'm Alice. And I'm Greg. And today we want to talk to you a little bit about some of the discoveries we made on our travels, unexpected discoveries. Part of our travels in Spain took us to a small village in the Navarra area. It's called Auritz Burguete, and it's an area where Alice, your family, comes from. Yeah, my great, 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 great grandparents came from there. Uh, and it is a place that has been Basque, even though it is in Spanish territory, mm -hmm. what is considered Spain now, it is an autonomous section of Spain, and it has been Basque for generations. Uh, and one of the things that, as we were walking through there, one of the things we noticed was that there was a sign in front of a church mm -hmm. that mentioned that there had been witch burnings there. Right, there's actually a very large sign uh, very detailed with a timeline um, indicating that this is part of what they call the witch trail in Navarre yeah. country. But it's actually an area, Auritz Burriete is an area where in 1525 a witchcraft hysteria kicked off with the finding and execution of five witches who were burned at the stake in the town square in front of the church in this leafy orchard area. It's pretty sad actually when you think about it. Yeah, it's sad because a lot of these witches were pretty young. I mean, it's sad anyway. It is surprising because when I think when I think of witch trials, my point of reference is Salem. Mm -hmm. And I think of how when you read about Salem, you read about the older women, the old crones that maybe didn't go along with the program, had their own ideas. And for that reason, they were persecuted. And it's similar and yet different in Nafaroa, right? Mm -hmm. In Navarra or Nafaroa, it seems like the average age of women accused of being witches was between 7 and 18 years old. So a really young age to be accused of being a witch. It's also an age maybe where you're coming into adolescence and you're questioning the way things are or questioning authority and those things would seem to run up against people in the wrong way and maybe lead to accusations of witchcraft. Yeah, I'm kind of proud of that actually. Mm -hmm. Proud that I come from a people who are questioning and rebellious. And sometimes when people talk about the Basque, they call them nationalistic. And I think that we get a different impression of what a nationalist mm -hmm. is here and now. But I think more than anything, what Basques were trying to protect was their culture, their heritage, and their language, which was difficult to do at certain points in their history when they came up w with people who wanted to try and dominate them and change them. Right. If you go back in history, the Basque, uh, Basque people had their own kingdom, the kingdom of Navarre, which was attacked at various points by France, by Gaul, by Spain. Pe different people tried to subjugate the Basque people, and none of them really succeeded. So <laughs> the Basque <laughs> are, are justly and defiantly independent people, which could possibly also explain why when the Spanish Inquisition came face to face with accusation of witchcraft in Navarre, they came down so hard on this area with literally mm -hmm. hundreds of people being executed over the course of maybe 200, 250 years. Not in Burguete, but there's a different area where um, there were, Murdi. yes, where also there was a, a huge witch hunt where 25% uh, of the population was accused of being witches. Which right, I think the wild. population <laughs> of the area was maybe 8,000. So you're talking about, you know, 2,000 people that were accused and incarcerated for witchcraft. I mean, we're, we're driving through this forest mm -hmm. and it's just, uh, it's not like neat little trees. They're just kind of, it's just nature mm -hmm. taking over. There's, um, it's dense forest. And I imagine 500 years ago, 400 years ago, this area was wild. And this and area also has its own reputation, mm -hmm. right? It's a forest with a history. It's a witchy forest. The forest around Oritz Burguete has its own name. It's called Sorgi Naritzaga which translated from Basque into Spanish is El Robledal de las Brujas, or the Oak Grove of the Witches. And this name predates the Spanish 
incursions into this area. So it had a very ancient history of just being a gathering space or a space of covens for witches. I think we also um, read a little bit about Celtic influence mm. in this area, even though we know that all ancient peoples know their own backyard, they know which plants are medicinal, which plants have curative uh, properties. So that's very normal and, mm -hmm. and you know, widespread. But uh, there I, is some talk about there being like Celtic right. religion influences in Basque. We, this area is surrounded by a very dense forest. It's easy to imagine how a small town like this that is so isolated up in the mountains completely surrounded by this very dark, deep forest um, and steeped in a history of witchcraft could easily become kind of a crucible for a witchcraft trial, which is exactly what happened in 1525 when five women were accused of being witches and executed by being burned at the stake. And that kicked off 200 years of, of basically what they called the Navarese um, witch hunt. Torquemada? The Torquemada was, yeah. was, there was actually one person that was a Spanish inquisitor that came over and said, I'm in charge here and I'm going to lead the witch hunt in Navarre. Mm -hmm. it, it was pretty bad for a while. Just about the time that my family started migrating to Chihuahua. Mexico is looking pretty good. <laughs> so yes, uh, it's weird, but yes, my family started coming down around, around that time. Uh, possibly well, coming down let's explain that yeah. so I mean because it's how did they get from Basque I'm, I'm country? not sure you know I'm I the the Basques are known as shipbuilders they were famously like seafaring people seafaring right. people remarkably good fishermen uh, as a matter of fact there is talk that they possibly drifted over into the Americas and uh, fished in the waters of okay. North America, mm -hmm. uh, but they chose to keep their fishing grounds secret so that none of the other countries would come over and get the fish. So they were like remarkable fishermen, right? Mm -hmm. Like they'd come, their, their ships would come with like two or three times the loads of other mm -hmm. places, but nobody knew. Like nobody No, knew. they kept it secret <laughs> for a reason. Yes. They wanted people to pay them <laughs> so I, I think what happened, in, in my understanding, is that they were enlisted with, enlisted by the Spanish crown to come over with the Spanish conquistadors and um, help them colonize Mexico. And Chihuahua is not near a body of water, aside from lakes, right? right? And when you look at it, you wonder, like, wow, what must they have thought, like, getting here? Well, we're, where desert. we were, where our family comes from, is pretty much... Desert, desert and uh, there's maybe a little chaparral you know it's, there it's... are mines <laughs> so if the Basque people were good at mining per perhaps they also needed livestock Chihuahua is an area that is definitely known for cattle for livestock and uh, that could also be a yeah there there are people in my family who have well last names like Cordero that would indicate that they were sheep herders sheep herders mm -hmm. yeah and we also have miners in our family but uh, but the other interesting thing is that once you get to Chihuahua, there is also a history of witchcraft. As a matter of fact, we were talking to some of our cousins recently, and they brought up this uh, Tia Abuela, who is who was said to be the head witch of Nica. And of course, I want to put a disclaimer in here that not everybody in the family considered her a witch, and not everybody even believes in witchcraft. Mm -hmm. uh, some people felt that, some of our relatives feel that this particular person was extremely powerful, that she was very intuitive and wise, and that she had answers to a lot of people's questions because she could use her powers of psychology mm -hmm. to figure out what somebody needed or wanted. There are others who really feel like she had supernatural powers and could like remove the malojo, the evil eye, and could give you herbs or oils that could solve your problems. So whatever the position of the family is, we're not really here to make a, a decision on that. Mm -hmm. And the area where your tia Abuela lived is a small town also called Nica. Nica is um, <laughs> A native, the, a native word that means place of the shadows. Yeah. And it, so it had been known 
for probably centuries prior to the Spanish arriving as a place of witchcraft. Yeah. The other interesting coincidence in Nica is Nica is the location of these massive underground caves full of gigantic selenite crystals, reminiscent of the crystal cave of Superman. They literally look like it come to life. I know. I look. It looks like. I think somebody went to Nica when they were making that movie. <laughs> <laughs> they must have seen photos of it, but it's a fairly recent discovery. I want to say within the past fifty years. And it's remarkable um, and like just the size of these crystals that have been there for, I don't know, millions of years. Millions of years, right? Yeah. It's taken time, pressure, a lot of heat and a lot of energy to create these crystals, which are the largest selenite crystals known to mankind. And apparently believers in the power of crystals say that these types of crystals hold massive amounts of, of power, energy, yeah. power and energy, yeah. which can be harnessed, harnessed by people that are intuitive. So again, another interesting connection whether or not you believe in any of this stuff, we find it interesting. We're not here to say it's the gospel truth, but it is um, certainly of interest to us. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. These crystals are <laughs> crystals are off limits to people who are not um, geologists or people who have special permission. They used to be open to the public for a brief period of time until they realized that going in the caves without special protective gear could actually cook you alive. Because <laughs> <laughs> the temperature there, I think, is they said about 140, 150 degrees. It's uh, very hot, and they uh, and humidity um, is my very. My cousin, very one of my cousins, said she actually was able to go in before they closed down, um, and that they would that they were, they had a medical team there that would like take your blood pressure and mm -hmm. make sure that you were in good health and able to to ride the ride. <laughs> and I read one anecdote about these caves that I found interesting. They said before they closed them off that they would allow the public to go in, right, with medical assistance. And at one point, women were forbidden from entering the caves because hmm. they said that women women's bodies would begin to glow after a few minutes in the caves because they would receive the heat and the energy and they would actually be physically seen to be glowing in the dark which is bizarre so i i think mm. that one i would take that one with a huge grain of salt but um yeah another little factoid about the caves and the witchcraft and the connection to the the power of the feminine which is yeah. to bring us back to the idea of witchcraft is i think that because it was associated with young females and it was at a time when the church exercised almost complete control over people's lives. The Catholic Church specifically is incredibly hierarchical, very patriarchal. Yeah. And you can understand how rebellious females with some knowledge of herbology and medicine outside <laughs> of the official, you know, official auspices of the church could be see, perceived as threats. Yeah. Absolutely. Women can be threatening. Mm -hmm. Well, a strong woman with a good mind. You see that in politics now, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the interesting things I found in investigating this story is I found online an, a copy of an original document from the time of the investigations that is written in Spanish and Euskera, which is the language of the Basque. There are eyewitness testimonies of hearsay or supposed witnesses. What did they call it? They called it like uh, chismorreo. Chismorreo. <laughs> Chismorros. Chismorreos. You know, gossipers, right? People that had said that they saw animals that were shaped like large toads that if you flattered them, they were black toads, and if you flattered them enough, they would spit out gold coins. Ooh. <laughs> but somebody saw this apparently happen and then they were so startled they called out Jesus and when the toad heard <laughs> the name of the Lord the coins disappeared and the toad <laughs> disappeared so there was no proof other than the eyewitness testimony which is pretty cool <laughs> I wish I had a gold spitting toad Being another, the, another, another thing that I found <laughs> is that they employed two young women as what they called witch finders, or was translated as witch tasters, which is an odd expression. But they were apparently women that had the ability to spot other witches or 
to mm. deduce that they were witches and part of this was through physical examination of the women's bodies mm. and one of the telltale <laughs> signs of a, being a witch is the existence of what is called a witch's teat uh, which is where a witch would suckle her familiar and Alice <laughs> well I have a story about that actually I uh, a few years ago I went to the doctor and I was getting a full examination and uh, she was doing a breast exam and she looked at a little mole that I have under my uh, breast and she said do you know what this is and I said yeah it's a mole <laughs> <laughs> she said, no, she said it's a like an undeveloped nipple. And I was a little freaked out. And she said, in the old days, you probably would have been burned at the stake as a witch because they believed that this was the mark of the devil. This was how you nurtured the devil or your familiar. So, uh, yeah. I hear your familiar is barking outside. <laughs> <laughs> we want milk. <laughs> so... Um, I was, when I was uh, performing with Alves a few years ago, I had to wear these two little sombreros on my breast. That was my costume. Uh, and it happened to be, th there's a photograph that was used by a professor in either, I'm not sure if it's a book or uh, a study that he did. And a friend of mine showed it to me and said, are these your breasts? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh yeah, for sure they're mine because I mean, you know, there's no head, no waist, nothing, just like the torso. But there was that little mark, that little the telltale sign, the telltale sign of the witch. I what declare you a witch. You shall so, burn the witch. <laughs> so we we, um, we wanted to bring this to you because it's you know right around Halloween time. We don't uh, necessarily expect you to believe in witches or not believe in witches or to think that we uh, are claiming the power of crystals or I'm putting in a bid for that toad that spits gold so <laughs> if anybody knows of the existence of a toad that spits gold so send we it my just way. wanted to share all this information with you for you to enjoy it make up your mind these are a lot of mm -hmm. these stories are passed down uh, in the oral tradition they're not I mean, aside from like the documents of the witch hunt, which are actually documented, the, you know, the fact that these connections actually exist is documented. Mm -hmm. Whether there are magical things in the world, witches and uh, crystals and coin spinning frogs, we'll leave that up to you to decide. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Alice and Greg. For those of you who celebrate, happy Sawain, happy Halloween for those who do not celebrate but just have fun with the holiday. And um, it's also Dia de Muertos right around the corner, which is similar in some ways and very different in other ways. We have All a video Day, on that. Whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate, we wanted to bring this to you just because mm -hmm. we want to share our adventures and um, we want to share our history with you. I, I love the fact that when we travel, it's not just about seeing pretty sights. It's, yes, Alritz Burguete is a beautiful village and I recommend going there. Apparently there's hike there, very bike good there. fishing and hiking and biking is, is a huge pastime there. It is a beautiful country, but it is also filled with fascinating, fascinating history. So don't ignore history when you're traveling and you'll get a lot more out of it. Thanks again for watching. We hope you liked this video. If you did, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That really helps. And click the notification bell so you'll be notified when we upload a new video, which is every Thursday. Thanks again and happy Halloween. See you next week.